Welcome to Leadership Brothers Podcast. My name is Gibson Piper. And I'm Brock Piper. And we are in episode two. Episode one was the Extreme Ownership Summary, where we went over the first four chapters of Extreme Ownership. So the first chapter, chapter five, is Cover and Move. Yep. What were your overall thoughts on Cover and Move? At first when I read, you know, it was a Cover and Move, I was thinking not anywhere close to teamwork is what it was going to come back to. Um so I didn't really know, like going in, I was like cover and move. I was thinking, you know, like maybe an execution, you know, not execution, how to execute something. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so I was thinking, you know, it's a way like, you know, you got to cover and then move your back, you know, the person with, you know, like your unit of like, I don't know how many people it is, maybe five people. And so like everyone's following you and you're covering, you're moving, you're, you know, you're making sure you got everyone's back. So essentially like I was thinking maybe how to execute more things properly, how to execute better. Um, then when it trains the teamwork, I was like, wow, it makes, you know, it makes sense still, but that was kind of when I first thought when I first like read the, ch- like the chapter. Yeah. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was early in the chapter, how, uh, he had to make that decision and he had to choose the least bad option. Yeah. But that was pretty yeah. interesting. Cause I was like, how many times have we been in our lives? We have to choose the least best option, mm-hmm. you know? And you're like, oh, well I get, you got to figure out, you know, what is the, <laughs> the, the least bad option, you mm-hmm. know? So, yeah, yeah. um, so yeah, so but yeah, for me, cover and move was, I think the hardest one to apply, to um, my leadership, uh, for basketball for sure. Mm-hmm. Just because it's like, I mean, defensively, yeah, cover and move. Like you, you cover the person, you know, and and, and then they, you move to the next defender if you need to for like rotations. Yeah, but like, for me, I don't have anybody else in my business. Yeah, that I have to worry about. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just me. So it's like I don't really have to make sure I'm coordinating with other people or anything. So it was a little bit difficult for me at first to kind of, um, I guess, relate to what what this was about. Um, but one of the things I liked on one eight page one eighteen was um, they had to make a quick decision, and he made that quick decision. He chose the the best, you know, least best option, and uh, they had to move, you know, kind of quickly. And he said everybody knew we would get into a gunfight. We we wanted that gunfight to be on our terms, not the enemy's. Yeah, I thought that was really good because that kind of mm-hmm. like that makes me think of like that default aggressive type mode where it's like you got to move first. You know, you got you got to be able to make that quick decision. Yeah, but then stick with that decision and, and execute that quickly. Mm-hmm. Right, kind of like make, you know, making the first punch essentially. Yeah, yeah like yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so basically, they get into uh, you know they're they're in in on their mission. And then they are coming back from their mission and they had to kind of make a couple of, of decisions of what they were going to do. And they made those decisions, they executed them, they got back to the base. Yep. Right. When they got back to the base, the uh, chief officer asked him, why didn't you use the other unit for cover? Mm-hmm. And then when you move past that, they use you for cover. And he kind of like, Leif kind of like looked back and was like, oh, yeah, that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one of the things where it's like that's how the teamwork kind of came in for me mm-hmm. was like, okay, that's how that applies to, to teamwork. Because cover and move you think of in a unit, right? Yeah, true. That's that's like obvious. Mm-hmm. But then how other people come into it and, and that, how that factors into what your decisions have to be. Yeah. Um, so I think when you run like a basketball program or a football program. Yeah. When I when I first heard of this, I kind of thought of a little bit of more football. I, I was gonna I was gonna talk about the football aspect of yeah, that. Yeah. So why don't you touch on that? I was thinking. Well, the main thing I was thinking about this is I was thinking in this scenario, I think you could really you know you can take unit one as the offense and unit two as the defense. You know, the offense they they operate separately. Essentially, they operate essentially, but really in reality, you if you think about them operating together, that can accomplish more goals. You know, like. The defense goes out and they play defense. There's no offense, obviously, there. So that's unit two. And if they don't, they're not really working directly with unit one. But essentially, is the defense job is to get the ball back so the offense can then go score to win. You know, that's how you win games. So essentially, if the offense and defense aren't really working together, which is hard to put, you know, it's hard to really, if you think about it like that, you know, often they, they can't work together essentially because they're not, they're two different times on the field. Um, but if you take the defense and you're like, okay, well, if you, this is hard to explain, I guess, because mm-hmm. my, you know, um, kind of like going back to like chapter three, believe when a defense believes, like they know why they need to stop the opponent from scoring is to one, 
win games, and then two, get their offense on the field. Then I think then they can cover and move and teamwork, work to work more together as a defensive unit to make sure the offensive unit can then help them out by staying on the field longer so that they get rest and all the, all the other intricate things that go into that. So that wasn't a great way of explaining it, but that's how I kind of saw it. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and, like, the way I kind of look at that as well is, like, it, the offense could blame the defense, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, kind yeah. of like like you talked about in the end of the, uh, of the chapter with that lesson with the business where he was like, the other movie company, they're owned by the same company, mm-hmm. but then they blame the other people for not doing their job right when really that's the best aspect of it, right? Yeah, they yeah. can work together because they're so close in that same parent company, um, which I think is a good way to look at it for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I liked um, – just talking about on page 120, 121, where he said, uh, Leif said, I was so focused on our own squad's dilemma. I didn't think to coordinate with the other team and work together. Yeah. And then it was a rude awakening for me. I become so immersed in the details, decision points, and immediate challenges of my own team that I'd forgotten about the other team, what they could do for us and how we might help them. Mm -hmm. So that to me was the biggest um, kind of lessons I took away from cover and move. Because, you know, I mean, for me, it, like I said, it was probably the hardest one for me to kind of apply and use in my, um, I guess, coaching and leadership philosophy right now. Mm-hmm. I think once I have my own program, have my own kind of like even varsity JV team as, as one, yeah, that's where the cover move can kind of come into play. Yeah. <clears throat> one place I did think um, this kind of applied was uh, for, for varsity basketball and and or boys basketball and then girls basketball is like a lot of times I feel like those two programs are almost butting heads Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, instead of working together, they may be able to mutually benefit. I I don't know how I just have to think about it, but that was the only place I really thought for me anyways. Mm -hmm. I think another big thing you could think about is too, is, uh, take not taking the players out of it, but strictly coaching football. If you take the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, um, and now they butt heads because it's the same team. They have the same goal, but if you have them, Working together, you, the offensive coordinator can be running up, drawing up an offensive play, and then be like, "Hey, defensive coordinator, come look at this. How would you stop it?" And then you, you know, instead of just thinking, "Oh, this will work automatically," or the "Defense, this will work," you know, if you, if you work together, then they will be able to be like, "Oh man, like, oh, you would stop it like that? Then we'll just sweep it around, you know, do a do a quick reverse screen, you know, something like that." Instead yeah. of like just doing two things separately and like, "Oh, this is defense, this is offense." The coordinators could come together and be like, "Hey, how would how would this work?" Stuff like that. Something yeah. you could definitely work it like that too. For sure, for sure. Did you have anything else on cover and move? I, I think, you, yeah, you, you kind of touched on it. It was like, uh, don't get too focused on the one specific thing. Or like, you know, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> that wasn't really... No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah, just don't get, yeah, just like, don't get too focused on the exact thing, I guess. Or like, yeah. you know, I think that I talked about that more in the chapter eight, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's move on to the next chapter, which is chapter six called Simple. I think this is my favorite chapter. Mm. Out of, of the whole book or the whole this part um, two? No, just, just the just what, part what, two. Yeah, yeah, what okay. we prepare for for mm-hmm, today. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I've been really working on how to simplify everything for me yeah. in my business and for just my life. Um, because like when I want to record a video, I had to do like four or five different things. And I was like, how can I do just one? Mm-hmm. Like, how can I just walk in, push a button, and we're good? Yeah. Right? Like... Like, that's why I want this a new desk, because it's like, I want to walk into, I want us, us two to walk into here, move the desk this way, mm-hmm. and then we're, we hit a button and we're good. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want anything else to come in the way. Yeah. I, I just want it to be simple. Because so that's then, why. Then it's like second nature, you know, to think about all that. You yeah. Know? That, well, now. It's one less thing to worry about. All my time can be, you know, spent preparing for just the podcast. Exactly. Or just a video I'm working on. Yeah. Instead of thinking about, okay, you know. Brock's coming over at, at, at 12. I have to, you know, get me prepared. I have to, you know, it's been 30 minutes preparing everything. It's just is like, mm-hmm. it's frustrating. You oh, know? yeah. No, so definitely. that's how, I'm, that for me, it was like, yes, this this is simple. This is what mm-hmm. I want. Yeah. You know? So the basic premise of how this came up was uh, the new leader. Yeah. New team leader was conducting the first mission for him. He had planned an in-depth, long mission. Mm -hmm. Very complex. Very complex. You know, very detailed, very complex. Mm -hmm. So what uh, Jocko and Leif kind of talked to him about was just go, your first mission, just go out and do an easy run. Just go out for like maybe 100 meters, Mm -hmm. right? 
and then and then have that be a success and then come back yeah and the the leader was a little little upset about that just because you know i think i could see the how you could get frustrated you put so much time into this complex plan you're like man this is gonna be great it's our first mission you know we're gonna do good and then they come back like hey let's scale that simplify it down i can see that how you could get frustrated with that yeah and uh and so they kind of had to scale that back Mm -hmm. and there they they said uh lieutenant i appreciate your motivation to get out there and get after it but perhaps at least for these first few patrols we need to simplify this a little bit simplify asked the mid leader incredulously it is just a patrol how complex can it get Mm -hmm. and uh it turns out it gets really complex really really complex yeah um, so basically what they did was kind of scaled it back and showed him why that they had to scale it back and, and different things like that. And he was a little bit, you know, apprehensive when they first did it. Uh, and then I liked, uh, I liked the, the, the kind of fun finale to this was it took 12 minutes for them to get first contact Yeah, and it went really bad and they ended up getting back. Everybody got back safely, but, mm-hmm. um, basically they kind of like it, it showed like, Hey, that's why we keep it simple. Mm-hmm, that's where you we know? do it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any anything from that um, that you liked from that chapter, from that story, just from that story, or that you know, those kind of lessons that? Yeah. Uh, I wrote down like it's a it's a good thing to have. You can it's a good thing to have a very detailed, complex plan that can be a good thing. But I think specifically for this situation, since it was such an intense and like one of the worst places to be in as far as fighting and something that we can never comprehend, um, I think his old plan could have meant, you know, it could have been one of them could have died, you know, a lot easier. And I think it was good that um, Jocko and and Leif were able to, you know, be like, hold on, let's get things and they have this, you know, option to become more simple because if they didn't have that option, we don't know what could have happened, you know. And it was good that then he was able to listen and then be like, yeah, we'll, we'll do it simple. Not really understanding how bad the, like how bad that area really was. So I think, it, and then I think it talked about like, it was like an italics. I think it was talking about like uh, the little, the little unspoken head nods they had toward each other. I thought that was cute. It was like, Hey, like it's all, it's all good. Like, like this is why we're here. This is why you're helping. This is why you listen to us. Like everything's all good. We're understand. No one got hurt. No one, you know, or no one died. You know, everything's okay. We'll just we'll regroup, and then now you have a little bit under your belt, and the next time you go out, you'll be more, you know, be more prepared, stuff like that. So I thought it was cool the way they like how both, you know, like leaders handled it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so they talk about the principle. Um, what I really liked is just kind of that first paragraph. Uh, combat, like anything in life, has inherent layers of complexities. Simplifying as much as possible is crucial to success. When plans and orders get too complicated. People may not understand them. And when things go wrong, and they inevitably do go wrong, complexity compounds issues that can spiral out of control into total disaster. Plans and orders must be communicated in a manner that is simple, clear, and concise. Did you write that down? I didn't write the full thing down. But, but simple, I, clear, I, and concise? I, I, no, I wrote down when things get too complicated, people do not understand them. That's, yeah. the, that's the one thing that I really like took, took away from that. Write down simple, clear, and concise. Mm-hmm. As a young coach, I wish I knew that. Um, because what, what would happen would be <clears throat> we, we put in, you know, maybe a, a player or, or 10 plays yeah and, uh, and it would be, they'd be really good plays and they'd be kind of complex. Mm-hmm. And then we'd get somebody who got two fouls in the first quarter and yeah. then somebody would come in off the bench and they did not know how to run that play. Mm-hmm. And w- if one person doesn't know how to do it, you're screwed. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. Like don't, uh, don't limit your options. Like say you have like an all-star you know, quarterback can play every position, and then third game of the season he gets hurt, and your whole offense was based around him. You put in there, you put the next guy in who's not as athletic and doesn't know the game, you know, doesn't know the scheme as well. Maybe, you know, you might not be able to, you know, do it because things were so complex for that such a high level athlete that can handle it. Then when the ne- next guy comes in, it that guy's not that complex enough to be able to do those things that you guys have built to be complex. So yeah, I think I think that's actually a really good thing that I'm gonna have to keep in mind. Yeah. So that would be the that's the one biggest thing that I took away from this: mm-hmm. is simple, clear, and concise. And I think it's it's simple, but it's also clear and concise. Because mm-hmm. if if your players don't understand it, yeah, and understand why you're doing it, or what you're doing, and you don't explain it in detail enough, then it won't matter. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And that's what they kind of talked about in the. And they applied to the business where they talk about the incentive program, mm-hmm. right? 
where they had a uh, a pretty <laughs> pretty complex. Yeah, I, I was I could not track what was happening when they were talking about it. I was like, I don't know what's going on. Let me just kind of okay. Yeah, I kind of like <laughs> I because I, I listened to it, so I kind of yeah. like skimmed and I was like, yeah, I don't want to try. I read it twice. Like, I'm, I'm trying, I was like, I read it twice. Nah, I'm not. I'm not reading it again. Yeah. I, I really yeah. don't know what these. The, I mean, they're high level, you know, really intelligent, you know, leaders. But but it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how saying, smart no, you are. No, I know. That's something. It was like they were too smart for their own good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it was like based on weight and like the different model and like it's it weight just, production. And then they, they went like six months back to track and stuff. I was just like, yeah. wow, that sounds. I yeah. Yeah, it's overwhelming when you read it. So oh, imagine yeah. trying to work and attain it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's that's a great example of. If we don't even try to understand it, it's like you're definitely your team's not going to try and understand it. No chance. Yeah. Um, So that for me was like, okay, that's a really good example of like, what am I doing right now that's really complicated that I can kind of simplify? Yeah. Right. So um, I'm actually working on building some some motion offensive stuff for our team. So I'm like, all right, what are the the five main actions in our offense that are most effective? And let's just do those every single day mm-hmm. until I stop coaching. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you're bread and butter. Yep. Yeah. So it's that way it's like if we need to make a quick adjustment, we can. If we need to, you know, be able to tell somebody, hey, when you when you're coming off of this, change it up real quick mm-hmm. and, and and that way we can go to a different concept. They understand the basics so perfectly that when we add one more thing, it's not adding much. Yeah. You know, where if you have twenty different things you try and do and then you add something, it just it bogs down to what you already don't, mm-hmm. what they already don't know. Yeah, I, th- I think it can be very good for uh, for football as well as basketball is. Well, won't actually every sport, but like specifically with football is. I remember my first year of college when college football I played. I had this playbook they gave to me over the summer, and they're like, "Hey, learn this." I was by myself. I didn't know how to, you know, I was, I, was, I knew football, so I was looking at it, and I was like, man, this is very, very complex. Because I was playing tight end, so I had to learn, how, I had to learn which way to block, and then some, you know, sometimes I have to go to go out for a route and which way to run it, and all that different things that are really complex. Um, and there was, I mean, over a hundred different things that I had to learn. So, when, I mean, I got, I tried to grasp as much as I could. When I when I came into camp, they were saying like, hey, did you did you study the playbook? I was like, yes, sir, I did. And he was like, oh, you're having some trouble with it. And I was, I didn't t- I mean, at the time, I didn't know how complex it was. Obviously, until like I'm looking back on it, like that's what I thought about when I first read that. Like when it's too complicated, it's hard to understand. And I had a hard time understanding it. And the problem I think I made was I didn't ask. I just said, oh, okay, and just just did my best and did what I could. And that's one thing I wrote down is, especially one being a coach, make sure your players know that they're allowed to ask. And more so of a player, don't be afraid to ask your coach, hey, I don't understand what you're saying or what's going on. Please explain it to me. So I, you know, and I coach with respect. I'd be like, well, thank you for saying that because now I want you to succeed and I want this team to succeed. So there's no way he'll be upset with that. So I think that's a good, like a key thing to remind yourself as. Yeah, for sure. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I, when they talk about kind of the bonus plan stuff, they were so emotional and passionate. They didn't recognize the vast complexity of it. Yeah, and I—I I mean, as coaches, I, for me, anyways, I got—you know—I'm—I'm I'm jacked up, you know, to, oh, yeah. to draw plays and have my team do this and do that and have fun with it. And then, you know, I got to kind of pull myself back now and realize, mm. okay, like, I can still have that play, but let's save it for a draw up situation in practice, exactly. so that yeah. way we can see if they are actually grasping the basics of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So when we add the counter they can execute it, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So uh, another thing that he kind of talked about was there's two things. People generally take the path of least resistance. Yeah. It's just in our nature. And, and as he read that, I actually had skipped the previous paragraph. (laughs) 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 And like, like not even like like, on purpose, but it was just like, I get the idea and I'd already, obviously already read it. Yeah. Like I get the idea of what they're doing. And I was like, I better go back and read you that. Go back and read the t- yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was, but I thought that was a really interesting point because it's true. Yeah, we we definitely do that. You know, we definitely do whatever is the easiest for us mm-hmm. at at all times, basically. Oh yeah. You know, which is why writing down my discipline goals of like going to the gym every day, mm-hmm. that's not that easy right now for me. Mm-hmm. So I need to do things that are hard. Mm-hmm. Um. So and then the the next thing that I had pointed out was, uh, he kind of was talking about. Um, his, when he was talking to his troops and he was talking about, they have a hard time following the intricacies of it. Yeah. Um, they might even get away with it for a few times if everything goes, you know, smoothly. And then he says, remember the enemy gets a vote. Yeah. I I like, I've always liked that. It's the best. That's that's really good. Because like, 
you know, the, regardless of how you think it's going to go, the enemy gets their say as well. And when they are going to do something to disrupt it, when something goes wrong, which it will, complex plans add to confusion, which can compound into disaster. Yeah. Right. And I really like that. Yeah. That's just to me is just, it stood out to me as, as the biggest thing. I even, I think I mentioned it last podcast I think too. Did. I remember that. Yeah. The enemy gets a vote, right? Like no matter what you think you're going to do, the enemy always always has an option to stop exactly. it. And I think that's like, like the enemy gets a vote. <clears throat> I think that's a very simple saying that, you know, like, uh, you know, it's very simple things like, hey, enemy gets a vote. Boom. Simple reminding, hey, this is the best offense in the world. No one can stop it. Oh, wait a second. Enemy gets a vote. Simple. Think about it. You know, yeah, exactly. That's, move, that's move why. From, yeah. I think, I think we get optim For me as a coach, I get optimistic of like, this will work. Yeah. And then it's like, well, what if it doesn't? It's like this. It's like this can't fail. Yeah, you know. It's like you get too overconfident, and then you forget that simple thing that the enemy gets a vote. So yeah, for that, sure. That'd be a good reminder for all coaches. Anything else you want to add on chapter six? Simple. Mm. Nope, I'm good on that chapter. Good. All right. So the next chapter is chapter seven. Prioritize and execute. BTF. Yes, this is my second favorite chapter. Yeah. Um, just almost overall in the whole book, mm. because it really, it really is one of the biggest things. I think for a leader yeah. is to be able to figure out what is the most important and organize that in your own way and then go ahead and execute those. And, and you can't move on to the next one until you've executed the last one. Yeah. Right. So this is, and obviously this is, I had to break out the BTF mug or Yeti for this. Yeah. This episode because it talks about the BTF, which is the big tough frog man. Love it. Right. It's it's yeah. I mean for for I don't know if it, if if women feel the same way, but like when I read stuff like this, I get like jacked up. Oh, like I get excited. Yeah. No. Th- yeah. This the story was my favorite because it was so intense and it, it, it I think that one of the, this story was the one that captured me the most and I was like, all right, I got to read this thing like twice to make sure I know exactly what happened because it was just so intense and so good and I wanted to see what happened and I'm so happy everyone made it out okay. You know. Yeah. Why don't you talk about it? Um, okay, so essentially they were, it was a night mission, and they were trying to, they were in a building, and to simplify it, you know, there were, the the best part of the story that I really liked was there was IEDs um, all around, and so there was, uh, I don't know, what are they called? The people that are looking for IEDs. Just like techs. There you go. They, you te- know, yeah, IED technicians. Uh, the IED technicians, that, and then they had these night goggles on, really cool. And they're looking out these windows and they're looking for anything that, you know, suspicious. And they see something in the front of the door that they're in, the building they're in. They're like, hey, hold on. That wasn't there when we first came in. You know, so they're looking at it and they see a little bit of like a silver. And they're like, hey, that's, there's that, there's something in that. Let's. So they go they go and tell, uh, I believe it was, it was Leif, Leif, right? Yeah, they tell Leif. And he's like, okay. And so then they go outside and they realize it. I don't know exactly what was in. It was a, it was a highly explosive bomb, essentially, what it was. And then they were like, okay, we need to set that off. Not anywhere near the seal, you know, not not near our team and not so we don't kill any, you know, that can go off in the middle of the day and kill a bunch of civilians or, or other seals that come into the building. So they needed to set it off to get it out the way. But the only problem was there was no other exit. So there was an exit through that door where the bomb is, and that was really the only place they could go. So what they did was the BTF comes into play. They're like, all right, let's just BTF it. And they took hammers, that sledgehammers they carry around to break like windows and glass if they need to. And they start just... Two minutes in a circuit, like in, 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 in like an effective motion, they're just smacking the back of this concrete wall, so they can go out the back, you know. And I was like, "This is cool!" Like I was getting, so I was like, "Oh man, but this, this, this is where the you know story gets good." And so they finally get through it, you know. They finally get enough, you know, room in the concrete wall so they can go through with their rucks and everything else on. They, you know, they check up, they do a head count, and while they're doing the head count, one guy is walking th- walking on top of the thing. And I, I think they're on the second story still, but they're going out the back because of the concrete wall. There was a tarp over a hole, essentially, and he, and he walks on it, not knowing it, and he falls straight through, you know, was 20 feet down almost. And he lands, and they don't know, they, they can't get to him, they, they don't have any ropes, they don't have anything, they don't know how to get to him. There's one place to get down to it, but it's barbed wired, and it's locked up, and it'll take, you know, at least a minute to get through, so then, and they're in, and then they're in, in the place when the, the, if you look up there's buildings everywhere and there's there's places where snipers could be and there's just not a good situation at all and this kind of comes to okay this is a really bad situation what's the best possible solution which is there's no good solution it's like what's the be- what's the least thing that's going to like the worst way to do it so he 
I think this is the one we, yeah, so he had to do the um, relax, look around and make a call. And so essentially he, uh, he made a lot of calls and he made, you know, he made the calls of, you know, set the perimeter up, you know, set the security up um, while the other team, while well, the techs are diffusing the bomb still and getting ready to set it off. And they sent these people to go through the, do- through the, through the doors to like, or the, the gate to get down to their fallen, you know, he's, he, they don't know if he's wounded. It could have been, you know, he could have cracked his head open. They have no idea what could have happened. And long story, you know, to wrap it up, they got, they got through the wall. They, they, the security was set up pretty, you know, well enough that no, nothing crazy happened. They got their soldier back. I think he was hurt, but I don't think, you know, nothing seriously happened because I think he landed on his ruck, right? So he landed on his back, but like it, it, it absorbed the blow enough so he didn't get too injured, you know? And they made it out. I don't, I, you know, I, I was reading the story. I was like, they better make this out alive because it's going to be really, you know, so they made it out, which is really good. And you can add something to that if I missed anything. And then they ended up blowing the bomb up as well, um, safely, obviously. And then that's why it was such a high intensity thing because the bomb was going to go off at a certain time because the Texas had already set it up to go off at this certain time. So they had to move out fast enough. So then they had to make sure they got out of, out of the, air, the blast zone, you know, all that different stuff. So you can speak on to it if I missed anything. Yeah. I mean, you covered everything. Um, the, the biggest thing, throughout all of that going on Mm -hmm. was the decision making of a leader yeah so Leif had to make a decision Mm -hmm. so he said how could he possibly tackle so many problems at once Mm -hmm. which is where it's prioritized and execute yep right figure out what is the most important what's the most pressing execute that then move to the next one Mm -hmm. so that to me I mean that was that was great and again it brings up the relaxed look around make a call for me that's that's my favorite especially for basketball to tell him, you know, relax, look around, make a call. He says, uh, page 161, even the most competent of leaders can be overwhelmed if they try to tackle multiple problems or a number of tasks simultaneously. The team will likely fail at each one of those tasks. Instead, leaders must determine the highest priority task and execute. When overwhelmed, fall back on this principle, prioritize and execute. Yeah, I thought that was really good. And the... the a way lesser version of what uh, the relax, you know, look around, make a call. When I was at work, you know, I, I'm driving a truck and I got to go all these different stops and I can't have, you know, if you're, if you're past a certain time, you have a late. And so on a much, much lower scale, I was running a little bit behind on time and I was driving and I, you know, it's, a, it's not super stressful, nothing compared to what the intensity they're going through, but I had to um, make a decision if I should go to this stop first, which closes two hours later, or, or go to this stop that closes now, if I had enough time to do it. And so I'm driving, and so I was like, I was like, do I do I do it? I didn't know what to do. So then I was like, hold up, relax. I was like, okay, cool. How much time do I have? I'm good. Boom. I went there. I got it. Fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, it actually was the wrong call. I ended up being late to that stop because that stop had more boxes than they usually do that I didn't account for. You know, stuff like that. So I think it was really, it was good because, you know, I mean, having a late is not as intense as, you know, an IED bomb or anything like that. You know, not even close. Not even close. Um but now I know for next time, hey, if I'm in the situation again, now I know earlier I made the bad call and I owned up to it. They asked me why. I was like, oh, yeah, I just, I just made the wrong call. I, I thought I had enough time. I did the calculations and I was wrong. You know, so I ended up having a little bit of a penalty. But now I know for next time, hey, do I have enough time? You know, same thing. Relax. No, I don't. Go there. Come there later. You know, stuff like that. So it was a real life situation that was really cool that I could read the book. And it was literally the same day. I read the, I read that book on Tuesday morning. It happened Tuesday afternoon. So it was really cool to, like, do that. And it's kind of I'm trying to apply it to my, to like, to my life right now. And it's really cool. Yeah, do that. that's great, man. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> that's awesome. Um, I think it's. I think that's what, when you can start applying some of this stuff to your actual mm-hmm. real life. It's I fun. Mean, that's that's great because that means you're actually learning it. Mm-hmm. You're not just reading the book. Exactly. You know, it's, it's it's life application. Mm-hmm. Which I think you learn from experience. You yeah. can read this all day long and talk about it all day long, but I think when you start looking at it, reading it, and applying it, then it's like, all right, wow, that was kind of fun to do it, even though I messed up. Who cares? Extreme ownership, own it, learn it, move on. Simple, yeah. you know. That's so. great, man. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that where he kind of talks about the bullet points, mm-hmm. where he talks about the uh, like to implement, the prioritize, and execute, yeah. kind of yeah, like yeah, what yeah. we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a couple. I didn't like all of them. Um, I mean, I, I I I like them, but like actually using them for what I'm doing. Yeah. Didn't like all of them. Uh, I like evaluate the highest priority problem. Lay it out in simple, clear, and concise terms from the highest priority for your team. Mm-hmm. Develop and determine a solution, right? And then seek input from key leaders when possible. I love that one, yeah. That was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I like, don't let the focus of one priority cause target fixation. Yeah. Maintain the ability to see other problems developing and rapidly shift as needed. 
Yeah. I thought those were the best points out of those. Although you can use all of them depending on what you're doing. Of course. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and then he talks about the um, CEO where he met with that CEO and he talks about, uh, you know, they had all these different plans and, and, and exciting things going on and all these new projects that they wanted to start and, mm-hmm. and, and not really any one of them that was really working that well. Um, so he talks about decisively engaged. Do you remember that? Decisively engaged, mm-hmm. where he describes a battle unit, uh, a battle in which a unit locked in a tough combat situation cannot maneuver uh, or execrate themselves. In other words, they cannot retreat. They must win. And with all the new initiatives, I would say you have a lot of battles going on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, you're, you're basically stretched too thin. Yeah. Right. So then it's like, what's your highest priority? Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that I actually had a problem with in my business. And, and I'm still figuring it out where it's like, I wanted to do six different things. Yeah. I wanted to do this. I wanted to add, add this. And, and I wanted to, to basically add things to my business. And, uh, and even starting the business, I wanted to have, uh, basically three different tiers and then three different options off of each one of those tiers and mm, like have like super complex, right? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, and have yeah. like an NBA option and a college basketball option and like just different, like just adding a whole bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, nah, that's, <laughs> I read the, actually I read this book and yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. nah, that's mm-hmm. not, that's not like what's, what's going to be simple, but what's also not going to like, what's going to allow me to focus the most. Yeah. Right. Like what's going to allow me to, to remain, to have the ability to kind of prioritize and execute. So when something comes up, Mm -hmm. which it definitely did, Mm -hmm. like a lot of things went wrong early on. Yeah. You know, I was able to kind of like prioritize which ones were the, were the worst, Mm -hmm. fix those and then move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I can definitely kind of agree with what Jocko was saying, where it's like, which, which is your highest priority. Mm -hmm. And I think that it kind of goes for life. It's like, which is your, what's your highest priority in life? Yeah. Just do that and execute that and then mm-hmm. move on. Like, so throughout the day. Um, so what I've been, I've been trying to do is in my kind of daily planner, I've been trying to kind of go over and have like my priorities for that day. Yeah. And then when I execute them, cross them off. Mm-hmm. You know, so that way I can at least apply a little bit of like, okay, I need to make this video today. Mm-hmm. When you do it, you check it off. Yeah. Boom. Nice. Do you have any other notes on prioritize and execute? Mm. Yeah, I think I wrote one thing and said uh, ex- try to stay one to two steps ahead. You know, so it's kind of just like you know you have to record this today. You know how to do it, but then something you know something happens bad. You know what you're gonna do the rest of the day, so you don't. Have, you know, I don't know. It's kind of just staying like ahead of the game because it's, so, it's almost like chess. Yeah. So do you mean like when you're going to your brother's graduation party? Or graduation ceremony, and mm-hmm. you don't leave on time, and then you mm-hmm. want to get food, and then you mm-hmm. get a speeding ticket because you you're late, and you need to get gas as well. Yeah, yeah, like that, like like plan plan ahead for that. Yeah, so yeah, it's planning. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to me, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that was that was a good a good example. I just really mm-hmm. wanted to make sure you had a real life example. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, what yeah. like you know some of the, the discipline struggles could be. Just I did it for you, just so you know. So <laughs> well, thank, yeah. Well, thank you, Gibson, for taking that one for the team. <laughs> but yeah, I lost. But yeah. I lost a lot of discipline over the last a lot of last month, and I'm, yeah, I'm which is it's regaining not, that back. Yeah, it's not good. Anyone gets a ticket, you know, whatever. But with that, made a quick little wake up call. Hey, Gib, you know, you know, I mean, you know why you you own it. You know, hey, I was yeah. on. Yeah. I wasn't even mad. I'm just like, yeah, it like, happened. It was even more. It's probably more frustrated. Like, man, like th- that's not. I, how was, I wanted that to go. I was disappointed in myself. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I felt like. uh in our in our family for sure i'm always the guy that's on time mm-hmm. or even early yeah I and mean, i was like oh. i was like me and you are more like that and sorry cody and mason you guys are not yeah so that was my exercise in failing in discipline mm-hmm. and for sure yeah but but in the, even in that scenario it's like i had to prioritize and execute when we were 10 minutes late it mm-hmm. was like okay let's just get there mm-hmm. safely yeah right don't speed anymore mm-hmm. find a parking spot get in the building get in sit down yeah and like that, that like, yeah that's just you had to i had to but i had to figure out like okay like what's gonna happen next exactly yeah and i did and we we got there we were there mm-hmm. so okay anything else on prioritize and execute nope cool chapter eight decentralized command this is the hardest one i think for you to grasp yeah because you haven't been a part of a, a- team really well like a coach leadership, leadership team. yeah i was gonna i was gonna say i was like yeah this 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 chapter for me was gonna be 
I read it and I was like, man, I don't, I can't even grasp most of this stuff right now. So yeah, I was gonna be like, this is gonna be Gibson section for me. You know, I mean, I'll talk when I can, what I what I think, but you know, I don't think I have no experience with this. Uh, so yeah, yeah, and I mean, I don't have a ton, mm-hmm. but I do have a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the, I think one of the you can always learn, and I think one of the things that for you since you want to be a football coach, yeah. I think decentralized command is where it's the most prominent mm-hmm. is in football. I agree. Cause he talks about, um, basically pushing leadership decision-making down to the frontline leaders was critical to success. Yeah. Right. The, that structure allowed, uh, the commander basically to, to have an overall view. And the example that he used was the uh, the in in the, in their positions mm-hmm. right? And we had a sniper team on the roof. Another team was like, we see moving on a roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if Leif had not been able to kind of be looking at the big picture, mm-hmm. he may have may they may have lost their lives because yeah. they were ready to attack. He made him recount, make sure that they were in the right position, mm-hmm. double check with both people, and they were end up they were noticing you know friendly is on the roof yeah and then they had to stop it real quick yeah yeah um which is a, a good example of kind of seeing that big picture the big picture yeah for sure yeah so um but for me uh, a couple of quick things in this was uh i immediately thought of football mm-hmm. right i immediately thought of okay they talk about the the amount of people you should be managing yeah. Right. A human can only manage about four to six other people. Mm-hmm. Right. At one time. So when I and I, I haven't been a part of a football staff, per se, mm-hmm. at like at the highest level of varsity, even mm-hmm. seen a little bit how their practices run where you can have, you know, the, the defensive backs, the linebackers, Backers, you know, corners, the corner. safety, yeah, you can you can and yeah, yeah right. You the, can, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, split yeah. it all up into position coaches. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas basketball, you're going to have 15 players on the team. So you can basically go three groups of five. Yeah, you know, four groups of three, three groups of four, however you want. Whatever you want to do, yeah, yeah however you want to split it up, a lot smaller, and uh, and yeah, and so it's a little bit different though, because in basketball you play offense and defense, exactly. Football, I mean, at the high school level, you can play, you, you play got, both yeah, ways. You definitely got both way players, but it's not as prevalent as in like something happens now you are playing defense in the middle of a play. Besides maybe an interception or a turnover randomly, right? Yeah, I mean, those, exactly. Those aren't yeah. like. Like in basketball, it's every, every possession, literally back and forth, it's, nonstop it's offense. Defense. When something else happens, you yeah. are now going to play defense. Exactly, you have to shift your mindset into that defensive mode. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was like, okay, you can have an offensive coordinator and defense coordinator in basketball, which you know we did. I obviously was the offensive coordinator yes. at the school I was at, but like, it's just a little bit harder. And so, but I, I did, I did like the fact that you could have those four or five different teams Mm -hmm. and oversee those four or five different teams Mm -hmm. right with just the the initial leaders who then report back to the one head coach basically would be in this scenario Mm -hmm. right so when when all that went down and the decentralized command came into play for the uh friendly fire incident yeah uh, he said he trusted his leaders to lead Mm -hmm. right and his ego took no offense to those leaders yeah he was proud to follow and lead and support them because he trained them because mm-hmm. they were aligned. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, what the biggest thing was, um, the reason that he could trust those leaders mm-hmm. was because they fully understood what was within their decision-making authority. Yeah. Right. So he, they knew what their responsibilities were they knew what they could and couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And therefore that allowed the main leader to trust what they were going to do. And I think that for me, that what I read within that was alignment. Yeah. Right. They're all aligned with the same goal, same mission, and they all understood the why they understood the how. Mm -hmm. Right. So that to me was like, okay, you have to basically, and to me that, that told me communication. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to communicate all of that with the people underneath you mm. to make sure they understood the goals and what the mission is. Yeah. So it's kind of, yeah. Cause like, I think one of my biggest goals is to become a head coach. Don't, I mean, I don't want to say don't care at level, but I'm assuming it's going to have to start at the high school level at, at one point. Um, so I think it's big and at, at any level, actually, if you're head coach to be able to be like offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, and then, in, you know, making sure like a linebackers coach, Hey, just, t- just teach linebackers, coach them very well 
but don't go over to the defensive backs and start trying to coach them. You know, so it's kind of like a lineman. Like, stay stay in your gap. Like, this is your linebackers. I don't want you going over to the defensive backs because you, you coach linebackers. You know, not saying he doesn't have the ability to coach the cornerbacks. Not saying he's not qualified. But if this is your goal, believe in that goal. Stick to that and have, leave leave the head coach and the, and the coordinators to do the whole thing. So it kind of, like, trickles down. Like, there's a head coach, two coordinators, bunch of positions and then it all goes into this huge teamwork that that eventually works out so that's something that i think that i, I looked at and i thought about it and that's a very good thing that i you know that i'm learning now because i'm not you know i'm not a part of any team you know any team yet yeah you know? that's so, that's huge to learn now i gotta tell you yeah because i didn't i, I didn't learn it until recently mm-hmm. i mean you know four years ago right yeah but i mean i wish i knew it maybe not four years ago, maybe two years ago yeah but i wish i knew it as soon as i could exactly, right i just yeah. didn't understand it mm-hmm. um so he kind of talks a little bit about, you know, the to, in the business part of it, the, the president, he kind of talks to him. Um, but I, what I liked is when he talks about um, the, like he thought that was like a mission statement. Um, a, and he says a mission statement tells your troops what they are doing. But they have to understand why they are doing it. When the subordinate leaders and the frontline troops fully understand the purpose of the mission, how it ties into strategic goals and what impact it has, then they can lead uh, even in the absence of explicit orders. Mm-hmm. So when, let's say, the head coach gets sick, yeah, right, like like our head coach would would, would get sick last year one day, right, yeah, yeah, and he was like, "You're running practice today," and I already knew exactly what he would do and how he would do it mm-hmm. and why he would do it. Yeah, and then he even missed a game, right? Mm-hmm. Didn't matter. Everything stays the same because as the assistant. I knew exactly what he wanted. Mm-hmm. I knew why he wanted it. And I knew how he wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. And so it was like literally nothing changed besides a new person in that area. And I think that's a really good example of it. Yeah. You know, if you can have your, if you trust your assistance to where you're not there mm-hmm. or even there on the other end, that's all you need. Oh, yeah. Right. If you can trust them, then it makes your job as a leader to look around, figure out the big picture you know, the, the, the chemistry of the team, you know, the leadership of the team, you know, who, if, if, if the, ke- if the chemistry is off, why, you know, instead of focusing on, man, I think it's footwork isn't that good. Mm-hmm. Like let your assistants focus on that. Mm-hmm. You focus on the camaraderie, the, the building, the culture, you know, everything mm-hmm. like that. No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Anything else on decentralized command? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I think we touched on it. It's uh, I said leaders at all levels must be empowered to actually like make decisions. So kind of talking about the same same thing we kind of talking about. I just really I just really like that and wrote that down because it's mm-hmm. kind of saying, um, you know, say you're the head coach, I'm the assistant coach. You have to you know be like, hey Brock, I I trust you enough to go lead, even when I, you know if, like if you get sick, you know, be like, hey, I trust I trust Brock enough. I'm you know. I want like you to make me feel empowered enough to be like, hey, I you know he's the head coach, he's the head coach and makes all the decisions, but I know I have a, I am also a leader and I can make a decision because he trusts you know we have that mutual trust between each other and I know you trust me enough to make that decision and I think that frees you know you up to be you know do bigger the bigger picture things and it frees me up to know like oh man get you know gives not you know head coach gives not watching over me all the time and I don't you know is this decision wrong bad it's just like hey no Gibson trusts me I'm gonna make this decision. And then if it doesn't work out, we'll talk about it. And you tell me why you didn't like it. And then we get back on the same page, stuff like that. So I think that, I think that I really like that. So going in to like, if I'm like a low, low level, you know, assistant, I got, you know, knowing why and how, what I'm supposed to be able to do. So I don't go out of my bound, you know, out of my zone. So people know, Hey, I, I trust Brock to coach that linebacker group without a doubt. You know, I know he's going to be good at that. And I'm going to trust him that. And once I know that, then it frees me up to just attack the linebackers, you know, attack them with everything I have and give them the good drills and all that good stuff. Which is really gonna be it's gonna be really fun, and I'm looking forward to doing that whenever that comes about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. for sure. We are going to kind of go over our daily discipline goals right now. Um, the whole point of this podcast is to get better as leaders, but also people. So one of the things that I asked Brock to do was kind of come up with some goals for this week, so we can check in next week and see how those goals went. What was your first goal? Yeah. So my uh, my first goal for the week is to go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday at six a.m. So it means waking up at five thirty, getting ready, and then getting to the gym at like in the locker room, changing at six a.m. What is your normal wake up time? My normal wake up time, so like we'll say la- like last week, normal wake up time was probably around seven thirty to eight, depending on the day. So I'm 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 gonna move you know move my wake up time a little bit earlier. 
uh, to get my day started, be more productive. So I'll have the same amount of time. Awesome. Awesome. My first was walk the dogs two times a day. Yeah, Buck, well, Buckeye too. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, just to yeah, get him yeah. in shape. Okay. Um, but just to get me kind of out of the house because I, you know, work from home and I'm staring at the screen for yeah, you know, six to eight hours at a time. Very so true. just kind of getting you know interrupting that pattern. Mm-hmm. Um, and then go to the gym every day. Nice. At some point, you know, mm-hmm. forever, how long it can be. So like, if we have workouts on Monday night, I'll go before workouts for you know an hour, you know, whatever, just to to work, you know, to to work out. In, mm-hmm. and not like oh, go hard or go crazy yeah but just to kind of stay in shape and, and, uh, and get there more cardio more more weight cardio. lifting Car- more we'll do cardio. cardio okay yeah okay. <clears throat> yeah I got you. um yeah just to because you know i kind of i've i've gained back some of the weight that i lost mm-hmm. uh just from eating unhealthy and not going to the gym and then my back started hurting so it just snowballed and, and and i lost a lot of that discipline so i want to kind of regain that back nice of just getting there yeah like just going there mm-hmm. and then and then we'll figure it out the routine of there. that and then you can build on that for yeah. sure yeah, yeah. And what's your my next one? uh my next one was uh so i did four months of no sugar from january to may 1st and once may 1st hit i didn't go crazy you know i had like you know one reese's egg one night i was like oh you know like whatever and i had a little bit of ice cream you know so i started doing a little bit of sugar and the next days were just terrible in the mornings i would have like not like insane headaches but it would be like a slight headache like one time i woke up and i was like dizzy just because i had i just ate sugar right before i went to bed so it's just this whole week i'm gonna do no sugar again for this one week and see how it goes and then if the headaches go away a little bit and stuff like that then i'm just gonna do no sugar for as long as i can but for this this one week i'm gonna do no sugar again to see how that plays into how i feel nice so nice yeah my next one's no soda or crap because <laughs> no i soda orange crap. vanilla coke man yeah yeah the orange vanilla coke man. that would get you yeah it was so good yeah um and my my last one i was gonna do is so on saturday at 8 a.m may 11th i'm taking the praxis uh for a pe um and so my goal was to be disciplined up and study at least one hour a day uh so i have five days to study boom on saturday morning i take it so i want to have at least you know be disciplined up to study at least one hour i feel like i should do it like more but i don't want to say at least two hours i feel like that might be you know setting too highly of a goal so i wanted to be at least an attainable goal of, of one hour yeah for day. sure and my last one was add value to somebody each, each day okay whether that's on um, you know online mm-hmm. in person calling somebody but just adding value to somebody each day nice i think that'd be a good goal just that is a good goal. just to, to help out in, in any way i can mm-hmm. and uh it doesn't have to be complicated just one little thing you know just just helping somebody along the way yeah no for sure 